Hi, and thank you for coming to hear about the Rare Disease Cures Accelerator data and analytics platform that we're developing through a collaboration with the Critical Path Institute and the National Organization of Rare, Dis Rare Disorders, funded through a collaborative grant from FDA. I'm here with my colleagues to tell you a bit about this project um, and really just introduce you to what we're trying to do, what we've done so far, and hoping you'll join us in this grand adventure to accelerate rare disease drug development. With me, on the, um, with me, I have Michelle Campbell, Senior Clinical Analyst for Stakeholder Engagement and Clinical Outcomes at FDA, and Vanessa Boulanger, the Director of Research at the National Organization for Rare Disorders. So thank you for joining us, and I will pass over to Michelle to start us off. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jane. Um, and thank you to all who are watching and are here to learn more about the Rare Disease Cures Accelerator Data Analytics Platform. Um, so I want to first introduce to you uh, why such this initiative has taken place and why we at FDA are encouraged um, and really push you for being able to accelerate um, and, and get more uh, treatments and therapies uh, to our rare disease population. Next slide. So if you're familiar with rare disease uh, drug development, you know that it is the ever-challenging space. Um, and what you see are some of those challenges, and these are just brief challenges that are that we all face from all the stakeholders, not only our industry members, but us as regulators and our patient groups. Um, when it comes to developing new treatments and therapies in the rare disease space, so first and foremost is the characterization of the disease. What exactly is the disease? What do we know about the disease or disorder? Do we have a well-known natural history and understanding of how the disease progresses? Do we understand the diagnosis of the disease? Um, do we understand the cause? Um, is it a random genetic mutation or is there something more that's going on? So we need to learn from our patients and our families from their lived experience of what impacts most from their disease. And learning from them what is the current landscape and available treatments that they may be receiving from their clinicians. And then if we do have something that's hopeful that we want to start testing, we need to know can we actually administer the investigational drug? So is it going to be um, an oral medication, an IV solution? What is it trying to do? Do we have preclinical safety data available? How, before we can actually test in humans. Is this safe? Is, is this before you put this into a, a rare disease population that are, already has a lot of comorbidities um, from their disease and disorder? Do we have a study design and protocol? Um, is that information that's going to be collected going to be adequate to support the information needed for review? Um, has an IND been submitted to the agency for us to review to make sure that safety has been established? and that dosing will be adequate and we're collecting the important information we would need for a review of a new marketing um, application if one wants to come in. How is um, access to the clinical trial site? Um, is these pa are patients far and have to travel far, which could be add patient burden for conducting assessments that may support efficacy? We need to understand how we're going to collect our study data. What is the appropriate endpoint? and what are the appropriate tools to be able to collect that information. So these are all the challenges that we face when we're looking at uh, in our rare disease space for drug development. And we all are trying to work together to, to find those answers. And we hope that the rare disease cure accelerator will help us lead to some of these answers that we need. Next slide. So why do we need a rare disease cure accelerator? Well, we know that we need to support um, and adopt a cooperative research approach to accelerate um, the work in research from the bench to the bedside. Um, and we really need to be doing this and supporting all aspects of research, um, translational research that will allow us to go from the bench to the bedside. We hope that a rare disease to accelerator framework will provide that infrastructure and the cooperativeness um, in the scientific rigor that's needed to do clinical trials and have clinical trial readiness for our rare diseases. Key components of the rare disease cures accelerator that the agency is putting forward include centralized and standardized infrastructure to support and accelerate rare disease characterization 
And that's what we're going to be focusing in on today. We we'll also see other critical components in our rare disease space include standard core sets of clinical outcome assessments, which measure impacts that matter most to patients. And we hope that these standard core uh, clinical outcome assessments can be applicable to more than one rare disease. Currently, work is going on in this space under different funding mechanism at the agency. And we have recently posted another um, request for uh, funding uh, for a new round of clinic standard core sets of clinical outcome assessments and, and really that are focusing in the rare disease um, space this time for this next funding. And ultimately, can we establish and start discussing a global rare disease clinical trials network? We know that drug development is global. We know in the rare disease space that we are looking for every rare patient with that disease and disorder and that even more makes rare disease drug development a global initiative. We recently had um, a request for um, information out that closed at the end of July to get key stakeholders thoughts and opinions on, on past experiences with other clinical trials networks to help us inform this work and initiative going forward. So stay tuned for more information as we continue to explore that area. Next slide. As I said, we're really going to be focusing um, today on our Rare Disease Cures Accelerator Data Analytics Platform. The FDA is funding this project, and this is a partnership uh, that working with the Critical Path Institute and the National Organization for Rare Disorders. We view RDCA DAP, as it's referred to, as a neutral and independent data collection and analytics hub that will provide a centralized and standardized infrastructure to support and accelerate rare disease characterization, that hopefully we will be able to have a goal of accelerating therapy development across our rare disease space. Next slide. The primary objective of RDCA DAP is to establish a data management and data repository system. This system will house data from existing and planned rare disease clinical studies and trials and this information can come from a variety of different um, data sources that will be discussed a little bit more later. And we hope that all of our stakeholders will consider contributing data because any piece of data is important to help us in establishing the disease characterization of our rare diseases. We hope that this platform will leverage the existing scientific expertise in both data management and rare disease knowledge with partnering scientific organizations through this initiative. The platform will build central, uh, will build clinical trial readiness in the pre-competitive space to foster both innovation for patients with rare diseases, as well as other stakeholders who are working to collaboratively in the rare disease drug development space. Next slide. So this slide, um, is a, is, a, is a great slide that I personally call our, our figure diagram that really uh, demonstrates what is our goals of this project and this initiative of the RDCA DAP and what is it looking like. And on the left-hand side, you see different sources of data, clinical trial data, registry data, natural history, imaging, surveillance data. And what we hope is that that people will want to contribute and data share their, their data that they have into this uh, data collaboration center where data will come in, it will be curated, it will be standardized, and it will eventually have a data analytics that will come out that will be user friendly. And our end users will be our various stakeholders in the rare disease space. So industry, academic, clinicians, who are looking to help and develop treatments and therapies for our patients. And we need all of our stakeholders to consider contributing because we need you at both the beginning and the end to make this initiative work. So at this time, I'd like to turn this over to Jane Markendale from the Critical Path Institute to talk a little bit more about RDCA DAP. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you for that great introduction for why we have launched this project, which I think is a really exciting project. It's a big project, it's an ambitious project, but we, we believe 
that if everybody in the community works together, we can really accelerate therapy development for rare diseases um, through this platform. So Michelle gave you a great introduction as to why we're doing this and what we're hoping to achieve. I'm going to get a little bit more into the nuts and bolts of it, how it works and what we're planning on doing. Next slide, please. So you just... You just saw a version, a version of this uh, of this image. This is the rare disease cures accelerator from soup to nuts. I'm going to start by talking a little bit about how we bring the data in. You may be a source. You may know, know of other sources of data that could be valuable to the project. And we want to talk to all of you. So I'll talk a bit about where the data comes from, how we bring it in, the process we're looking at for curation and standardization. And then I'm going to talk a little bit more about the analytics and what the data will look like coming out the other end, because some of you may also be potential users of this to accelerate your own rare disease drug programs. Next slide, please. So this is just a, uh, really a flow chart of what this looks, lo looks like in slightly more detail. As Michelle has already told you, we're interested in all kinds of data, clinical trial data, even just the placebo arm if that's all you're willing to share, natural history data, patient registry data, Data directly from clinics well, um, over time, we'll be looking at health records, genomics, all sorts of data sets. In each case, we'll reach out to, to you or you can reach out to us. And we put in place what we call a data sharing agreement. You retain ownership of your data. It will always be your data, not our data. But we put, put into place a data sharing agreement that allows us to make sure that we understand that the data was collected ethically and the patients consented to it being shared. And you tell us what we can do with that data. Our preference, because we believe it moves the scientific field forward the fastest, is to share with, with everybody. But some people may not be comfortable with that for some reasons or other. Maybe the data's not been published yet. Maybe it's an ongoing drug development program. In which case, you can look at sharing only after approval through a um, data use committee. Or you may look at sharing just within the platform. So the patient level data is never seen by anyone except the IDC ADAPT staff who will then use it for analysis, and the analysis will be made public, or to develop drug development tools, which could be made public. But outside users wouldn't see the patient level data. They might still be able to search the metadata, the summary level data to know what, what exists. But with each of that, um, those terms is negotiated one-on-one -on -one with the owner of each data set. Once that's in place, and we've all agreed, that the, um, agreed to share, we, um, we send a secure link. That allows the data to be transferred from you to us in an, um, in a very secure way, it's all encrypted, it's all safe, and it comes to us and goes straight into a data vault separate from the rest of our data until we're checked that it's been appropriately de-identified so we meet all international laws, that it hasn't got garbled on the transfer process and it all makes sense. Then for each data set, we'll go through a, per, um, a process of curation, taking a look at the data, does it contain everything we want, do we understand the units of everything, are the measures looking like something reasonable. Do we have a 500 year old patient? If if we do, we need to go back and check with you if that was how it was recorded in your records, because it's clearly incorrect. And depending on the type of data, we will then standardize it. Our goal is to get as much data as possible into CDISC standards so it's appropriate for regulatory submissions of the future. Not all data sets will be appropriate for that, but it will all be standardized and the metadata will be tagged so we can make it as searchable as possible. Then if the permissions allow us, we'll make that data available, integrated with all the other data in the AR database. So people will be able to go into the database through what we're calling the interrogator interface and search that data in all sorts of different ways. So if you were interested in understanding the progression of an individual disease, you might pull out all the data on that individual disease. But if you were interested in understanding the dynamics of a biomarker or an outcome assessment, you might pull out data from a number of related diseases to understand the dynamics of that biomarker or outcome assessment to then inform your drug development program. And we think this is really important, particularly for the extremely rare diseases where there might not be enough data in existence on that one disease. But by looking at several related diseases, you might start to understand how a biomarker relates to clin clinically meaningful outcomes or what change might be clinically meaningful and be worth looking at. So we envisage this being used both for hypothesis-driven research to understand what should, could I look at, and real drug development tool development to um, move understanding of these outcome measures and biomarkers and disease progression and natural history to a level that really can be used by regulators to evaluate drugs. And that is where we'll really accelerate drug development. So the output of our platform is going to be both the data that we can share and being made available to outside users to use the data, whether that's before or after going through a data use committee, 
and some basic analyses that we'll do on the platform and the potential to then collaborate with our quantitative uh, medicine team to develop much more advanced tools that then may go through qualification or fit for purpose pathways with the regulators and be made available to the community. So the, ba the basic um, data availability, the data searching, the basic analysis is part of the platform and the ability to potentially partner on, a, on additional drug development tools is an added bonus. Next slide, please. So the question we could probably get most often is, well, where's your data coming from and why would anybody share the data with you? And I think for those of us who have worked in the, in the data sharing community for some time, it's very clear to us, is particularly in rare diseases where each data set is, a, is going to be small. These are rare diseases, we don't have many patients. But by combining as many data sets as we can, we start to build up a size of a database you can really use to analyze the patient population as a whole and understand the variability in that disease understand patients in different places, whether they are progressing the same ways or different ways. Are there differences in standard of care? Are patients in one part of the country using a, um, a treatment that other parts of the country aren't? So to really understand the variability of disease, we need these bigger data sets. So people want to share with us, not only because it's the right thing to do for the community, but also because it helps them add to their data to get a, better, a bigger picture of the disease and design better clinical trials. It helps us look across rare diseases. I mentioned earlier about being able to look at biomarkers and outcome assessments across related diseases or looking at a symptom in various related diseases to see if perhaps your, th your drug might um, be effective in more than one disease. And of course, we try and make it as easy as possible for people to share with us. Copying the data and sending it over to us is very easy. The uh, data sharing agreement allows you to tell us what we can do with the data. So it's really powerful, easy to share with us, and it's very powerful to have those bigger data sets available to all of us. Next slide. So I'm gonna change text just slightly here and, to, um, and talk to you more about why we're doing this. What use is all that data anyway? If you're piling together data from all these different sources, what use is it? What, we, what can people do with the data? And this slide really just, just show, shows what, where we're trying to get to. Traditionally, particularly in rare diseases, when you went to design a clinical trial, you might have information on a few patients you've seen. You go and talk to the, the key opinion leader in the field, and they'll say, based on my experience, you should run a 50-person trial for two years and use this endpoint, and we think you'll, you'll see an effect if your drug works. Rather than all that guesswork, we want to move to a world where when you look into that crystal ball, really, the brain of your nearest key opinion leader, instead of just seeing some, somebody or a small group of people's experience, you see all the available information, what's been done before, all the data that's been collected. In some diseases, this is not going to be much data, and in some diseases, it's going to be a whole lot of data. And, and the quantitative analysis of that data to really use it as best as possible. So instead of making guesses, we're using all the information we have to design clinical trials that will really tell us whether a drug works or not. Next slide. So what sort of tools can we build from these data? These are examples from various CPATH consortia that have been around for, around for a little while. So they've already gone through the stages of finding the data, standardizing the data, curating the data, and then do it, building various models from that data that can move drug development forwards. But I like to show this slide because it shows jumping ahead a year or so, once we have more data in, in, the, in the RDCA gap, the sorts of things we'll be able to do with that data. So my first example is the development of a biomarker total kidney volume, which was developed for polycystic kidney disease. The polycystic kidney disease out um, outcomes consortium pulled a, a bunch of clinical data, clinical registry data together, built a series of models, and qualified this biomarker as a prognostic biomarker for polycystic kidney disease. And I love to show this example because since then, it was accepted as a reasonably likely surrogate endpoint, and a drug was actually approved on this um, biomarker. So a great success, but again, it could never have happened without the data aggregation and integration and sharing that allowed the building of the models and to move that field forwards. Like again, please. My second example, this is Parkinson's disease. This one isn't a rare disease, but it's just a nice example of another, another um, tool. This was a clinical trial enrichment tool in Parkinson's disease, where they looked at um, groups of patients who, who were dopamine transmitter positive by imaging and looked at that as an enrichment biomarker. Again, this has been qualified through EMA as, um, as an enrichment biomarker. 
and it shows that uh, by using that, um, that batch enrichment biomarker in this particular simulation I'm showing, you can reduce the trial size by 25% without losing power. So you can use 25% fewer patients and still see if your drug works to, with the same power as without. So again, a really nice example of modeling in a biomarker that could accelerate a field and makes things quicker, cheaper, and easier in drug development. And then my final example, and this one um, is work that's still ongoing, is in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And this, this is the work of the Duchenne Regulatory Science Consortium, which is really trying to understand variability in a rare disease. Duchenne muscular dystrophy is incredibly variable. We've had a number of drug trials that have come out the other end without showing statistical significance, resulting in a lot of arguments as to whether the drug really works or not. And our, this consortium went out to really try and understand the variability and has been building a series of disease progression models to explain the variance as best as possible. So you can optimize the right patients and the right endpoints and the right length of trial and size of trial to show significance if your drug does what you expect it to do. And that work's still ongoing, but it's, it's looking, um, looking very positive over time. So those are just three examples. There are so many more things we can do with this data, but this is why we're building RDCA DAP. Is so we can build these kinds of tools, make the data available so other people can build these kinds of tools and really accelerate drug development. We want to make it cheaper and easier for the companies to do the clinical trials. We want to make it easier for the regulators to understand the results and see definitively if drugs work or not. And we want to get um, treatments to patients as fast as possible. Fortunately, in this case, all of those goals are completely aligned. And by using all the data and everything, as much as possible, we can really accelerate rare disease drug development. Next slide. So just coming back to the, um, our original diagram, I just wanted to show this in a slightly different way. So starting at the beginning, we have individual data sets of all sorts of different kinds. We're trying to bring them together, get them into what we're calling the data lake, and from there into data warehouses where we can really access and use data sets for analysis. If you click again, please. So then instead of just having that single small trial with maybe 40, 100, 200 patients, suddenly you have an integrated database of thousands of patients, we hope, depends on the disease, of course, which we can then make available to either ourselves, our quantitative medicine program, consortia of companies or other researchers who are interested in developing tools or just individual researchers around the world. This is, there are too many diseases and too many potential analyses for us to do, to do it all ourselves. With the real goal, you can click again, um, is, is, um, and again, is getting to these actionable drug development solutions. And the picture down there is of a clinical trial simulation tool, but all of these other solutions, biomarkers, endpoints, models, to really help drive rare disease drug development forwards. And that's what we're work, working towards. The RDCA DAP is largely focused on getting the data together and making it available through an analytics interface so we can use it. And then we'll partner with other people or other people can work on the data themselves to really get to these drug development solutions that will move the world forwards. Next slide. So with that, thank you very much. I think I've probably spoken for more than my time, but I'd like to pass on now to Vanessa Boulanger, who's going to tell us about why this is important to patients, why patients want us to be doing this, and really what this means to the rare disease community. So thank you very much. And Vanessa, over to you. Great, thank you so much, Jane, and thank you, Michelle, as well, for your thoughtful presentation on this topic um, and this important initiative. So next slide. Um, I'd just like to bring us briefly back to some of the high-level challenges to rare disease drug development and then touch on how the RDC ADAP is designed to provide solutions to some of these challenges in order to accelerate our understanding of rare diseases, how they progress, so how the disease looks or changes over time, the presentation of the disease in different people, for example, and then how to leverage that information to help inform the design of clinical trials. So we know that there are over 7,000 rare diseases and fewer than 10% have an FDA-approved treatment. Many rare conditions are not even being studied yet, and we as a community have a big opportunity to change that. There are lots of different types of data and information that we can bring together to increase our understanding of these diseases now while new data and tools are being generated. Next slide. So designing RDC ADAPT to overcome some of the persistent challenges to rare disease drug development is a priority for CPATH and NORD so that as a rare disease community, we can collect better data, design better trials, and get treatments ready for approval faster. 
So by bringing rare disease data together in a central location, RDCA DAP aims to promote an in-depth understanding of the characterization and natural history of a rare disease, accelerate our understanding of rare conditions and encourage commercial or research interest, encourage innovation and the refinement of clinical trial design so that resources, time, financial, and human are utilized efficiently and trials are planned with inclusivity and accessibility in mind and promote the sharing and expanded use of existing data. So opening opportunities for within and across disease discovery. Next slide. So together, how do we build that foundation of rare disease information that we need in order to accelerate cures for rare diseases? Each person, each experience is so critically important and valuable to unlocking the next advancement for their rare condition. So working together to make the experience of sharing data easy, while also ensuring that data is collected in the most usable way, is the foundation needed in order to support the development of treatments that are meaningful, that reflect the preferences and priorities of rare communities, and then that are available for use in shorter time frames. So in other words, it's through this data that we arrive at a better understanding of rare diseases, what matters to people, what we need to measure, how to design the studies, and then how to develop the most impactful treatment. And as researchers, we certainly have a responsibility to reduce the burden of participation and to authentically build relationships and engage patients and patient organizations as active partners. We have many reasons to judiciously and thoughtfully leverage resources to reduce burden on patients. And one approach to this is sharing data and bringing together data and information that we have available to us now so that we can expand our understanding of rare disease characterization. And the data that we're, we're looking at is really clinical trial data, natural history studies, patient registries, and data from other sources. And that's the data that will drive the RDC ADAPT model so that we can um, optimize our trial design. Next slide. So why share data with RDC ADAPT? Larger data sets increase the collective power of the data, and that ends up translating into more efficient and informed drug development. This tool will help to empower patient communities. Their data collected through natural history studies and clinical trials, for example, will pave the way. Their experiences matter, and they're so valuable for not only benefiting a single disease community, but benefiting the entire rare disease community as a whole. And RDC ADAPT will provide tools to help study sponsors and researchers leverage the data that was collected for a particular purpose, but could be envisioned for other use cases. The data in RDC ADAPT, as, as Jane mentioned, will help us move from sort of traditional drug development approaches where there's a reliance on limited information and experience where we may not have a complete picture of a disease to more um, of a data modeling approach where we're really leveraging all available information to inform the best approach to drug development. Next slide. And so for those of you who are actively participating in studies, we encourage you and we'll support you in conversations about RDC ADAPT with study sponsors. For those of you who are leading data collection efforts and are interested in sharing the data, we've included some contact information for CPAS so the discussion can continue. And if you're not yet currently participating or, or running a patient registry or one doesn't exist for the condition of interest, we encourage you to reach out to NORD to learn more about our work. Next slide. So in short, we want to hear from you. The relationships that we build through RDC ADAPT will support the growth and expansion of this initiative. It's a really exciting way to advance rare therapies and we hope that you'll join us on this journey. And then I just wanted to to share that we have open registration for our public workshop, which is coming up on October 19th from 11 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. Eastern, where we will share our progress from the first year of RDC ADAPT, case studies, and some use cases for how the initiative works, and then different ways to get involved. So we certainly hope that you'll join us there. Thank you to AZBio for supporting this session, and thank you for the, to the audience for tuning in today. <laughs>